Some of you may know me. I'm the CEO and founder of MicroWrite Incorporated. I'm going to make this very short because I really want to focus on the content more than talking about myself. In short, <clears throat> I'm a med school dropout. Uh, thank you, go to meeting for switching the slide on me. I'm a med school dropout uh, and um, clinical scientist. Uh, I was the founder of uh, medical laboratories for the entire South Zone of Israel. That taught me what contamination does to humans. And if we look at uh, the 483s this year, and I'm going to go back here because uh, this is switching on me a little bit. And I know there is a lot of traffic going on uh, on GoToMeeting, and this is an issue we are facing even with conference calls. 2019 saw most warning letters, 81 worldwide issues issued to makers of finished medicinal products. These, this is number is the largest since 2015. You know, the question we should all ask ourselves is why? And, and you know, as we, as we go through the presentation, uh, the, the technology has changed our understanding of of contamination control or or uh, you know quality has changed and also um, regulators uh, uh, you know we all are growing and as we are growing we are seeing that we are finding more issues e either ourselves are finding more issues or the regulators are so for 2019, these are the top procedures applicable to quality units shall be in writing and shall be followed. So in short, FDA is saying, don't do things willy-nilly, proceduralize them. Investigations is going to the top. And if you followed for the past 10 years, this, this percentage keeps on changing. Just three years back, cleaning validation was the top. Now it's you know procedures, then investigations, facilities is become very prominent. Why? Because I feel, and not only feel, I see um, uh, with our interaction with uh, regulators and with the clients that the focus is becoming facilities because you cannot you cannot build a house with a weak foundation. And facilities is the foundation of our entire aseptic uh, process or even non-sterile, correct? Contamination challenges are equally important for sterile and non-sterile. Lab control should include sound, scientifically sound process uh, procedures. Production and process controls is another thing. You know, if anybody is following EU Annex 1, and to tell you frankly, we have been very, very instrumental beyond the board of IEST, and we also comment on Annex 1. This is the reg latest regulatory, uh, leg regulatory thinking, right? And Annex 1 is not just for MHRA and for EU. It, all the participating, uh, PICS participating companies have contributed it, uh, to it. And everybody has taken their learnings and their observations and created this document which is a wonderful doc it's not perfect far from perfect but it is a step in the right direction master production records and controls it's always been in the middle control for my uh, of microbiological contamination has gone up it's significantly significantly gone up personnel qualifications, appropriate lab tests, and OOSs. This is something I've noticed for the past two years, and I had attended one of uh, the FDA uh, meetings uh, at the PDA, local PDA in San Francisco, and the inspector said they have, they should pay more attention to OOS, and I'm seeing the results of that, and we'll address that. 
equipment cleaning and maintenance always. All these things are related to what? Either the source of contamination, right? Monitoring and control of contamination and patient risk. So it is interesting that the frequency of 2.11, uh, uh, 113 CFR has, has been rising. Let's go to this. So what do the regulators expect? They come and inspect you and what do they want? A lot of time when warning letters are issued, there is something that in the end, GMP consultant required. This recommendation is changing. Look at what they're saying. Independent assessment or higher qualified consultants. And as we go through the slides and as we go through the uh, case studies, you will see what I'm trying to drive home is paper compliance does not help procedures and CAPAs don't take us anywhere. Us understanding our facilities, process, and the product, and of course, risk to patient is what should be at the forefront when responding to a um, 483 observation. So going back, compliance, what does it mean? The definition of compliance means following a rule on order. Non-compliance is failure and GMP. We all tout GMP, but GMP is again not paper. It starts from materials, premises, up to your testing, your personnel, and so on and so forth. One of the common issues that me and my team come across when responding to 483s or warning letter remediation, and this is a question I want everybody to note down and remember. What trumps, what trumps a regulation, a guidance, a publication, what? And sometimes when we respond to 483s, we refer to publications. Regulation is top, CFRs are 21 CFR 210 to 11, that is tops. If we are dealing with MHRA, UNX1 is a regulation that tops. Many times I will see people responding to 483 observation and say, according to PDA a technical report, PDA technical report is not a regulation. It is an opinion of, of course, qualified people, but it's still an opinion. You have to keep in mind what is the regulation? USP is not a regulation. <clears throat> and this is very, very important. I have seen people say ISO 14644 regulation. It's not a regulation, it is a standard. And those are the common mistakes that are often make in made in responding to 483s. And regulators see it and they say, you cannot differentiate you don't know what you should comply to. And that's where when we say compliance is a rule or order. The reality is FDA's view of a company's performance may differ from the firm self-assessment. That happens all the time. We think, okay, you know, we have done our self-assessment, we are good to go comes a regulator, inspector, and he may have a different view. Why so? You have to understand, this is exactly what we face day in and day out. Because we, the regulators are going to many companies. They are learning. As they go, they are learning from others' mistakes, and then they know how to uh, identify. As company employees, we see our processes only. We, we are not aware of somebody else's processes, somebody else's systems. And that is why there is a discrepancy between a regulator's view of, uh, um, you know, assessment of your processes and product and your view. Sometimes the cause is a drift over time in quality oversight. 
10 years back, you could not have had a 483, and now all of a sudden you have started getting 483 is what happened. We humans, we, became, we become complacent. We do. Things are going good. We are good. We are FDA's good book. In FDA's good books, we are doing good. But remember, everything is evolving and we have to evolve with it. Other times, it is lack of resources. Now, whatever the cause, FDA has a way of finding vulnerabilities and the company is left with a new reality where remediation is a mandate alongside running actual businesses. We see companies struggling. Great, great companies provide great services to humanity. We're doing very, very well. And now they are stuck doing 483, uh, responses, remediation work, warning letter responses, remediation work, but the business has to go on as usual. It takes a toll. It takes a toll on the people and the management. There are a number of reasons, starting from knowledge, keeping up with updated technologies, guidance, regulatory thinking, and risk appetite. This is a this is a topic I can talk for another 15 minutes, but we don't have the time. You have to you have to evaluate your risk appetite. How much risk appetite are you do you have? And is your risk appetite high or low? Does it meet regulatory requirements? And are you keeping the patient safe? The cost of compliance grows exponentially the further you are in development. Now you have developed, you have multiple products, right? It goes up all the time. So, you know, I tell people, anybody who got an income tax notice it should always be worried that you are an income tax file, right? They can come back to you to check on you. And that is exactly how you should treat a 483 observation. A thorough response with actionable follow-ups and a commitment to addressing issues is required. This is where uh, I, I think I can add a lot of value. You don't, you don't do a response to just, okay, you know what? If we made the FDA happy. No. I told you it's an income tax notice. This goes as a point. You have to have an actionable follow-up and a commitment that you are going to resolve this issue once and for all. Regulators need to know that you are serious about fixing the issue, not just one-time deal. It's not a band-aid. The response and the commitment can leave you with competitive advantage or a competitive disadvantage. You want a competitive advantage. It is a little more work. It is a, a knowledge base, but you need a competitive advantage even after you have received a 483. The FDA wants you to see that you comply with GMPs in order to ensure the quality of the product and patient safety. Patient safety, that is at the... Uh, and, you know, that is what they audit us for. If the response responses are not predictive for accomplishing these two, further actions are inevitable. So you have to show whatever responses you give will enhance the quality of the product and keep the patient safe. Also writing skills, you know, many a times, uh, my clients tell me, we know uh, technically you're very savvy. We are learning from you, but what I want, we want to learn is how you write. It's very important that you don't take shortcuts in writing. Explain yourself. It doesn't matter how, with the right regulations, with the right standards, right? Explain yourself and show that you are committed to correcting the issue. Issuing an initial response is one of the most critical regulatory responses. It's so difficult. 
right? And you are torn between what you know, what your advisors are telling you, is this right or wrong? Are you, there's a sense of fear, right? But I always tell people, if you are based in science, that fear is eliminated. A well thought out and a thorough response can change the tenor even for further interactions with the FDA, right? Have you write the response? Have you make the commitment? This, uh, you know, your, your, your commitment to keep the quality top notch is how you can interact, uh, your tenor uh, of interaction will be. Conversely, misguided or antagonistic, you do not, if you are in the wrong, let me make it simple. If you are in the wrong, acknowledge it and make a commitment to change it. And I'm going to give you a case study where actually a client, um, a company tried to prove FDA wrong. Uh, don't get me wrong, okay? Not every FDA inspector, and they acknowledge it, right? Not every inspector knows every aspect of manufacturing. Some could be very good at quality control analytical, some could be microbiologists, some could be compliance people, right? They might not know. And this is where I always tell people, if you have good, uh, you know, good communication during the inspection and you can sort of educate the, uh, the regulator on your process and your thinking, you could be right. And, and sometimes it happens that the regulator will make a mistake. Changing procedures, initiating CAPAs or retraining should not be a gener generic response. And uh, in my life's last slide, I have, I've said that, that FDA doesn't want you to say, we are going to retrain the people. That's not the response. You have to get to the root cause, make a commitment, follow up, keep your, keep your commitment. The more, the more comprehensive the response, the more FDA will be assured that your company takes the concern seriously. Every response to feed FDA should clearly acknowledge the deficiency if the inspector's findings were correct and with merit, okay? That is one thing you have to look for yourself. A good root cause analysis before you respond makes you see if you have an issue and you will be intelligently able to respond to the, to the 483. In other cases, the inspect, inspector could have missed the key data or not had the experience, right? In such circumstances, what do you say? Yes, sir, we will correct. And you know, you commit to an overkill, which actually may not be required. You have to explain that too. And I've seen so many companies, FDA, uh, uh, the inspector says, do this. Yes, sir, we will do it. The, I'm telling you, you will, if you're going to do, make an, or commit to an overkill, you will deviate. And that is a cause for another 483 in the next uh, inspection. So understand, was there merit to this 483? If there was merit to this 483, do a good root cause analysis, accept, accept your deficiency and respond accordingly. If there's no merit and the, and the inspector missed something or didn't understand, well, explain it. And they're very open, they're very open to it. What are the points to consider, okay? The final element of a successful response is the description of the set of actions or programs to correct and prevent recurrence of issues addressed in the op observations. Remember, the key is prevent recurrence. You cannot respond and go back to the old ways. And you will if you don't understand the root cause. Instilling confidence in the remediation plan, that is your job. So if you have a well thought out response, you are actually helping yourselves. Failure to demonstrate proof of corrections could lead to more compliance risks, right? So if, and, and I will show you some of, uh, uh, some of the comments to people's responses, FDA said it's not enough. 
you you just addressed a small part of it there is a whole big story behind it you did not even look at that fda would rather see achievable due dates than correct the root cause with a, and that correct the root cause with a workable solution rather than a quick fix they want you have to give due dates that are achievable by you because then keep on asking extension extension doesn't put you in the best light so in short although responding to a 483 can be a complicated process it can be reduced in several key components acknowledge if it is it has merit explain if it doesn't have merit ascertain the root cause you have to ascertain the root cause and the root cause cannot be ascertained if you don't have the correct knowledge base and i'm going to repeat this many times this is where we see the issues and through the case studies you'll see that i'm right here reacting with commitment and urgency acknowledge when you need outside expertise and there is there's a chapter I've written paper compliance versus uh, versus uh, uh, scientific uh, understanding. Very important measurement. You have to measure your progress till completion. Let's start with this. These are similar observation year after year for the past five years. Why? You fail to prevent adequate, uh, perform adequate unit directional airflow smoke studies under dynamic conditions to determine how the movement of the air and personnel during aseptic operations could pose risk to product sterility. In addition, the studies indicate that your aseptic processing equipment is not properly designed. This is going to increase even further. I think the regulators now connect the design issues with quality issues and if you look at for uh, uh, gmp annex one what does the contamination control strategy consist of starting from facility design to maintenance to monitoring and so on and so forth significant air airflow turbulence uh, turbulence including air movement and a in short, they're saying that you did not have unidirectional airflow. And what are we supposed to have in aseptic products? To first air to your open product. Every time they see that you are not providing first air to your open product, this is the result. And this has gone just in the last three years, I don't know how many people have got, how many companies have gotten the same, same 483s. Can everybody hear me well, uh, Uday? Yeah, yeah. You're very clear, Ziva. Go ahead. Uh, good. Very important because I got a notice uh, that there could be some connection issues and I want to make sure. Inadequate. I'm not going to read through everything. But in short, they're, what they're saying is we are seeing turbulent air. Turbulent air is good in grade B. Grade A needs to be unidirectional, not laminar. There's a big difference. Without smoke study to demonstrate unidirectional airflows all over aseptic processing and processing steps, you cannot show that your processes are designed to prevent microbial contamination right we cannot depend on sterility if you look at uh, uh, the 483s related to sterility fda keeps on saying again and again you 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 know you looked at the sterility and we we will get to those 483s but you looked only at a small picture you didn't take a holistic approach you didn't go back to your manufacturing process or your facilities The sterile filling line for injectable products lacks unidirectional airflow, right? It's not robust. Every time I see these 483s, I, I see that there is more and more 
things that the FDA is noticing. And, and even the 483s are written differently every time. Opening the enclosure significantly disrupts airflow. This is a common scenario. I don't have to tell you, you have to do your research on FDA.gov and just uh, uh, do a, a, a search and you will see the same thing, but there is diff more and more details in this kind of 483s. So let me explain to you. I'm not just going to tell you how to write. I'm, I'm, I'm going to also teach you how to look for these issues. So this is a great open wraps. And I'm not going to go through barrier system history. We started with open clean rooms and now we are in isolators. And we think, okay, we have this magic box. Everything will be perfect. We don't have to worry about it. No, that's not true. That's not true. So if you see this open wrap system, right? What does open wrap do? Doesn't have its own air supply. So now you have first air flowing over the product surfaces. The air goes down, it's the door is closed, correct? Now door opens, what happens? Where is the air coming from? And where is it going? If you look here, this is a manifold. This is near the stopper bowl. There is air going this way. There's air from the HEPA filter, top green, but there's air. Where is this air coming from? That means this is a not sealed enclosure. These are things that the regulators have started seeing now. Let's look at this. This is an issue short circuit and this is so oh my god this is so prominent it's and i'm i just because we are uh, talking to indian indian uh, pharma right now please do not think that this is only your issue this is issue that we're seeing worldwide what is happening the air comes down it goes over the operator onto the inlet grill of the rams. Isn't the operator sacred here? Because this is the operator who will be opening the door and floors are dirty or clean. They're dirty. So you see this air is coming down, lifting the dirt over the operator into the inlet grid. grid. And what is he doing? What is this air doing? It's contaminating the operator. That is why we see so many 483s and some data integrity issues, because we don't understand this concept. Let's look at another one, okay? Your form failed to maintain buildings used in the manufacture, processing, packaging, or holding of drug products in good state of repair. Aging facilities has been the focus of FDA. Uh, last October, uh, uh, the FDA talked about aging facilities. The focus was aging facilities. This was at the Global Micromeet. This year's focus again is aging facilities. And, and, and FDA inspectors will be speaking. So I'm telling you the focus is becoming on aging facilities. What do you mean by aging facilities? These are older designs. They are not state of the art and there is no state of the art. Okay, if you don't, if you don't look at all, all the aspects and just bring a piece of the fanciest equipment, put it in your clean room and you think it's uh, state of the art, it's not. Integration is a big part of it. So, this facility is an aging facility, right? And it says, it is essential that your plant management maintains the facility in good state of repair to ensure ongoing suitability of drug manufacturing. My team of engineers and uh, airflow and uh, uh, clean room personnel have coined this term, stealing from Peter to pay Paul. It's not my terminology, it's their terminology. You know, the concept was very good. 
the concept was, you know what? This is sacred. This is our enclosure to the right. We are going to give an extra protection of giving it a unidirectional airflow. Great idea, great thought process, good commitment to quality. But what happened? The inlet grill is right next to the HEPA filter. So what happens? We are stealing from the HEPA filter, which is we call it the LAF part, to feed the RABS. Stealing from the LAF to feed the RABS. And what happens here underneath? We wanted it to be clean because from here we will be going into the grade A. Did we keep it clean? No, it does not, the air does not even reach halfway. So this part becomes dirty and the people here, you know, we shed all the time and I'm going to give you some numbers. So here, if a person is working for eight hours at the end of the, sh at the end of the shift, trust me, he, will con he may contaminate the product and you will see it in your environmental monitoring. There's another thing that I wanted to show you. This is one of, uh, again, is the same thing, stealing from Peter to pay Paul, but this is an aging facility. You don't see it very well, but there, there is a lot of caulking uh, in the corners and all. What does that indicate? That indicates that there was a leak, and if there's a leak, there is mold. And this company was cited for what? Mold contamination even though it was terminally sterilized. Look at these uh, uh, curtains. Curtains are dirty. That's from the last century. Your facility design may, may represent an additional contamination risk, right? Your monitoring procedure does not require sampling from uh, from with predominant predetermined locations identified as critical control points. According to your response, you will increase sampling frequency of, for your RAMs. Does that respond satisfy FDA? It does not. When the when the inspector came, he saw, hmm, you haven't done a, a risk assessment to identify where uh, there is risk to product, open product, and have sampling points there, right? But then you responded, we are going to increase. It, they're not telling you to increase. They're telling you, look at what is happening. What are the critical control points? Increasing does not solve the problem. So now, they gave a response that we will increase sampling and they came back and said, however, you fail to specify whether you will ensure sampling in daily operations. Again, in response to this letter, specify sampling locations in your RABS and your improved sampling procedures. So you saw that your increased sampling got refuted right away. <laughs> Because what is their fear? What is their fear is you have issues there, you haven't, and you are sampling willy-nilly just for sampling sake. This is a good example. This is a, a, a company. Uh, South America, okay. Um, this is a company that got really hit hard for issues. I want you to look at this. If they had data integrity issues and they said we will do sampling, more sampling or whatever, what is the problem here? I want you to think through this. You see that this is open wraps. Are we doing okay, Uday? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Please stop me if, if there are any uh, any uh, disruptions in, in the voice quality. Now, you see, we have full HEPA filters, right? On the ceiling, you said, perfect, full HEPA filters. But then we have put this box here, open wraps, 
correct? I want you to look at the glove ports, guys. The glove ports are on two sides of the door. And the door always has a slight slit. What can happen? The operator number one is as tall as your, excuse me, rat. He is breathing through that slit <coughs> because the design is not perfect. And now he's breathing and most probably they were getting hits right there. That's where they decided we won't do risk assessment and find out not because they did not want to do it, because they did not know how to do it. I always tell people, it's not that people don't want to do it. Everybody wants to do the right thing, but they don't know how to do the right thing. So let's look at this, okay? So this person is standing here. As you said, that uh, you saw that the HEPA filter extends beyond the open ramps. The air falls on the guy, uh, person, the operator's head, bounces, goes directly into the ramps. Does that make sense? These are the things you have to understand before you respond. This is another very common scenario during our inspection. Our investigators observed several deficiencies uh, related to your aseptic manufacturing. The, uh, the rabs had fallen off the enclosure systems. You know, you these gaps, these, these are an easy fix. We see this all the time. You tell me, can you, when you do cleaning of your rabs, can you go inside and cl clean these gaps between the HEPA filters? You can't. There are simple solutions. And then you can get during. And this kind of a design then comes to eddy currents in smoke studies, which FDA is catching very fast nowadays, right? Plus, it can start contamination, right? Spore forming organisms. Because you can't clean those gaps. This is a very good example. This is a very good example. There were gaps. And you see, you saw the smoke going that way. Rab's frame crosses HEPA air path above critical area between light, blank, and HEPA filter. These are things that lead to a lot of 483s. We are going to do this. This is very important. You know, we are all on that CAR T bandwagon, right? Cell therapy, gene therapy bandwagon. This is a common phenomena that we are seeing. We say BSCs will not protect us unless we protect our BSCs. Very true. You fail to thoroughly investigate five in process BSC settling plates failure. Three of the five settling plates were positive with penibacillus. Glucanolyticus. The root cause and source of the contaminating organisms was not identified. No corrective actions were implemented, and four impacted batches, in process batches, right, were subsequently distributed. Look at this. BSC is, again, like RABS is not magic, BSC is not a magic. What happens? The exhaust. Where it is going, it's creating room-wide eddy current. It goes up over the operator into the BSC. These things have to be designed. There's a lot of things that you have to understand before you choose the BSC, before you install the BSC. We'll talk a little bit more about it, okay? So not only now, it's from humans, all the dirt from the chair and everything is going directly into the BSC. I'm going to give you another good example. This is a really good one. This was just last year. We are so, sometimes we think we can clean our way to sterility. No, we cannot. We cannot. This is a tissue bag, okay? Good work, great people, good work. They, are, they were taking the umbilical cord tissue 
and make it, it uh, into a product which saves so many third degree burn patients. Isn't that a great cause? But what they did, they loved using phenolic compounds and they cleaned the BSCs with phenolic compounds. And if you know phenolic compounds leave residues, so what did they do? They blocked the grill and the grill is the one that takes in the outside air so that it got, doesn't go into the BSC. So now what is happening here is here you go, the outside air comes here, bounces because it's all, all uh, sealed be uh, with the residue and bounces off onto the different product. And this was an aseptically uh, processed uh, tissue. Placement where you place it, your certification, your cleaning, very important. Very important beyond, of course, uh, have you work in it. But these are things that you have to look at. The other thing is sealing returns is past century, okay? We are learning all the time. Now, this 483 talks about you had sealing returns. Sealing returns don't belong to clean rooms, especially not only aseptic, even non steroid Why? Because five micron particles don't carry so well up right? They're heavy particles, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, it's okay. Where do they hang out? They hang out at work level. Great example is a facility that we, uh, my team audited. Uh, and luckily the client caught it and they said, uh, we think there's something off here. They wanted a sterile sampling booth in an ISO 8 room. But the ISO 8 room had what? had sealing returns. And the sterile sampling booth had negative pressure. That means anything from outside can go inside the sterile sampling booth. Sealing returns, all five micron, micron particles at work level, and the negatively pressured BSE sucks them in there. They could have never made any, any transfer of sterile, you know, any sam sterile sampling at all. Very important to understand. This is a very good example, okay? You see, this is sealing returns. There's a HEPA, but there's a return. So what happens? There's much more uh, engineering stuff that I cannot talk to. Um, this is, again, a very good thought. Basic, and I've shown this before, but here they had a LAF, which is, the, the, again, the intent is good, is the understanding. So they wanted to protect the enclosure, but the inlet was out up there. So all the air went up. Isolators are not magic. And we are dealing these days with flex, uh, flex lines and different uh, uh, isolators and robotics. And I, I mean, I can talk another 15 minutes on static charge in robotics, which is uh, uh, really not understood how uh, particles and including microbes can adhere to surfaces in clean room because of static charge. But this is an isolator. The FDA loved the product, but did not give them the blessing to manufacture the product. Why? We talked this before. First air, first air to the filling needle, important. HEPA filters on the side. Which needle gets the first air? First needle. There is no assurance that any other needle will get first air. I'm not going to talk about smoke studies, just telling you these are the things that people are saying. ISP has a, a webinar on the 17th, I think, Uday. 18, 18, 18th of April. 18th, 18th of April. April. Yes. Try not to miss that, please, because there's a lot of learning from a man who started doing smoke studies in, the, in 1984 using cigarettes to today uh, with the latest technologies. Uh, this, this is just a few things I want to say. Uh, th these are the 483s uh, that have come up this year, in 2019, smoke is too weak, cannot visualize, smoke is ejected very fast, 
So you are giving us false uh, information. Smoke is dissipating too fast. You have not captured your uh, uh, dynamic, um, your interventions in the dynamic study and simulations were incomplete. You only did part of the simulations. You did not do all of them. The other thing is pressure differential. Isn't that important to us? If we lose the pressure differential in a facility, what happens? Outside air rushes in. Shouldn't be all knowing all the time what is the temperature, what is the humidity, what is the pressure differential, and what is the count, a particulate count. These are all interrelated, especially part particulate counts, and, and there have been 483s regarding the design that is designed. We do have magnetic, uh, I mean, we do have these uh, devices at the door sometimes. Sometimes we are still doing manual, uh, manual note of the pressure differential, but at the door does not help us because the operator should know. And that is why the continuous, we, we invest a lot in continuous monitoring systems, but we don't integrate it with our BMS system which is very important. And I think that is something FBA started looking at very closely. Again, this is the BMS system. They're cl clearly saying that you have a BMS system that's all great and uh, dandy for differential pressure and non-viable monitoring for not, uh, appears to be out of control, right? This is a bad scenario. Thousands of alarms, thousands of alarms. These alarms, should be seen visible in the in your processing areas. It, it's not facilities uh, job to come and tell us people who are within the facility or who are doing the operation should know. And you say you they said you conduct a comprehensive evaluation risk assessment to determine how these frequent event affecting your process aseptic processing. Of course it is. It is. Let's go to this. This is this is just becoming too much. This has been going on for three or four years. Environmental monitoring, sampling locations. What they are saying that you have not. For we we found that settling plates are not appropriately placed in the critical areas, and I told you the reasons why. If we do a risk assessment, we will come to know, oh my God, we have eddies here, we have deviant air, we have dead air here. And if we could understand that, we could have a good risk-based environmental monitoring program. And here the FDA said, your smoke study showed that during the setup and filling air flows towards the front and the back of the rabs were off. I don't know what they, what they meant. However, two relevant sampling points were recently eliminated. Why did we eliminate those? Because we didn't understand why those two points were failing. If we understood this, we would have known them. Again, the intent is good. The understanding sometimes is deficient. So you did not utilize environmental monitoring data to identify environmental control issues. Your microbiology lab did not accurately report results. The investigator observed underreporting. Where does that stem from? That stems from design issues. It's very common worldwide. This is also another uh, very important one. According to your response, it was difficult to accurately locate plates. Again, this is considering serious lapses by facilities management. This is where they are now linking your EM deviations, your EM, God forbid, data integrity to your facility issues. Despite your claim that your operators were appropriately trained, video recordings of your manufacturing operations clearly showed that your employees were not following proper aseptic techniques. I mean, this is a very, very dire situation. And I always tell wherever we work uh, for 483, a warning letter remediation, I, we always emphasize to management, don't blame the operator. 
give them the tools required. They want to do the right thing. But if you provide the tools required, we will not have all these issues. And how do we know what tools are required? Knowledge base. This is another one. This is, there are so many for non-viable particle monitoring these days. Uh, oh, this picture is too big. Okay, I think I will have to forego this. So, you know, PITS guidance and uh, ISO uh, clearly recommend that your uh, uh, probes for non-viable monitoring should be within 12 inches of the critical product, right? Product contact uh, components. And this is, uh, this is being seen by FDA. Apart from that, there are a lot of other 483s coming up. There are not too many, but don't expect uh, uh, not to see them uh, this year is your tubing length and your bend radius of your tubing. Very important because if you have a, lo a long tube, you will not be able to get the right data. This is another one, data integrity. Okay, your microbiology lab did not, I'm so sorry, did not accurately report results. No growth on positive control plate for media. And what, does, what was the cause? Desiccated, cracked, or otherwise damaged plates, right? If you are a microbiologist or you are an aseptic manufacturer, this is sacred. Microbiology media uh, will tell you whether you will have a sterility test failure or not. Are you going to introduce contamination or not? Very important. What this company did is they said, okay, we are going to do a study to assess the, assess the signs of desiccation in plates. There is absolutely no need to do a study. Why do a study? It's obvious, it's black and white. You have dry plates, cracked plates, pitted plates, uh, discolored plates, very thin media. What do you think happened? I told you, if your responses are not convincing, do not think that the FDA will wait two years. They got an inspection very fast because what they did is they did not acknowledge their mistake. Yes, we have. Why are you doing a study? There's no need to. Our inspection also, re uh, okay, uh, revealed poor aseptic processing operation behavior, right? Your plan to assure appropriate aseptic practice practices and the clean room behavior during production includes specific steps to ensure routine supervisory oversight for all production batches, comprehensive identification for of all contamination hazards with respect to your aseptic processes, equipment, and facilities. It's coming up all the time, equipment and facilities. Provide a risk assessment that covers all human interactions. For sterile, human interactions are very important. And equipment placement and ergonomics. I have seen five related to ergonomics. And I'm going to tell you, your operators are your gatekeepers. If they are not com comfortable, if you're, let's say you, you have during your design of your rabs or whatever, isolators, you have put your glove par parts, uh, glove port so high, your short operators will stick to the doors. If you haven't given the right PPE, uncomfortable shoes, they're going to lean against the walls. These are the things you're going to look at when there are aseptic uh, breaches. Also include a detailed CAPA plan with timelines. Did I talk to you about timelines? To address the findings of the contamination hazards risk assessment. They want timelines and give them a reasonable timeline. Don't rush through it. Understand what is happening. I love this because many a times we always, I, it's my pet peeve to tell management, please don't, don't, 
tell me the operators are at fault. They're not. Operator training is not going to address the root cause. And here you see F FDA is saying you determine the inadequate lighting and if ineffective of operator training were root causes. It's not the in ineffective operator training. And why did they say this? Because they had compromised gowns. Operator training has nothing to do with compromised gowns. Nothing at all. Nada. And I'll tell you why. What is important in gowns? This is the barrier between humans. We all talk about humans are the ones that are the more, uh, create most contamination. Then why don't we protect them well? And we doesn't, it's not their responsibility to check gowns. I'm sorry. If the contract is not well written, if the sizing is incorrect, if the number of laundries is not defined, if those issues from the laundry is not communicated to you, if you don't have adequate stock, inadequate sterility mix-ups, you will have compromised gowns. It's, it's a very common phenomenon. In many countries, they have their own laundries, in-house laundries, and then they iron. What do they do by ironing? They're actually breaking up the garments. Their filter efficacy goes down. I encourage you all, we are on the board of IEST, not ISPE, IEST. And this is a, this is a um, uh, paper you have to look at and buy it because it tells you all that is required for laundering gowns. Do you know that you cannot use, you can only use non-ionic detergents. You cannot use cationic or anionic detergents because your gowns will disintegrate. You cannot use more than 60 degrees for drying or washing. Your gowns will disintegrate. Ironing will disintegrate your gowns. And how do you measure that? And I'm going to go to that. This is, if your laundered, laundry uh, cycle does not follow this, you will end up with what that 483 was, is compromised gowns. This is an IESTRP uh, CC003.4. There is also ISP or uh, IEST RPCC005.4, which is related to gloves. And often we mix surgical gloves with clean room gloves. Surgical gloves do not have the sterility assurance or uh, the durability of of uh, clean room gloves. And that is why you see a lot of 483s related to holes, pinholes, or compromised gloves. And I highly recommend, uh, do, uh, please do get this. Henke drum test is a measure. It'll tell you when your go uh, garments have started disintegrating and your laundry cycles should be decided, not by, because you decided 100 laundries, but what the Hemke drum test is telling you when your part particle generation is accelerating. Now we always say the operator is, is dirty, correct? Here you got Hank Avalon's. It is useful to uh, assume that the operator is always contaminated while operating in aseptic area. If the procedures are viewed from this perspective, those practices which are exposing the product to contamination are more, more easily identified. A gown operator sheds up to 10,000 CFUs per hour or more. This is by the particle gurus, Ryan Muller and Linguist and Will White. Look at this. This is in the rags. This man is doing setup. Look what is happening. The air is going over his head directly onto the process. There, dispel the myths before you begin when it comes to disinfection. 
we love doing disinfectant qualification studies, and I've seen this worldwide, and I get into arguments with regulators all the time and with companies, and I was also on a committee where stop this, I said, stop this. This is such a subjective test. It's subjective because it depends upon the method you use, your method validation, the uh, recovery, right? And you cannot control operator variability here. So your recovery is all across the board. The main the key uh, point I want to bring is you should choose the right disinfectants considering the compatibility with your surfaces, compatibility with your supplies, and intercompatibility between the disin disinfectants. For example, bleach and quaternary ammonium compounds negate each other. Surprise, you will end up in contamination or use, using hydrogen peroxide, but you're using cotton cotton wipes, it decreases the efficacy of hydrogen peroxide and you're surprised. Well, you know what, my disinfectant qualification showed a, um, hydrogen peroxide gives me a three log reduction, but I still have contamination because you're using the wrong wipes. All these things have to be well understood. Fogging, fogging is not magic. It's not magic. One thing I know we all have played with soap bubbles, right? You must be having children or you yourself as a child have played with soap bubbles. The bigger the bu bubble, it falls faster, it bursts faster. Your fogging has depend on the particle size. Neutral buoyancy, I keep on saying it's, it's, is a thing at microid, neutral buoyancy. That will keep the disinfectant in the air and it will go into the nooks and crannies and it will not burst, the particles won't burst, right? And it will get to the areas which are hard to reach. Very important to understand that. Let's look at equipment contamination. You failed to use uh, equipment contamination has been all the time among the top 10, all the time. And uh, 2019 is no exception. You fail to use equipment in manufacture, processing, packaging, or holding of drug products, right? What are they saying? This appropriate design fosters the development of biofilms. It's not tic-tac-toe round, I go, if I miss, I get this. Uh, this disinfectant, this cleaning agent didn't work, I will do this cleaning agent. You have to perform your disinfect, your cleaning validation studies, and also consider biofilm formation. Okay? This is a very bad response. The FDA cited them on equipment contamination. They said we will be... This uh, FDA respond mentioned polishing equipment surface and changing cleaning agent and cleaning procedure. No, they don't want to see that. They want to see a comprehensive, a very comprehensive independent retrospective assessment of cleaning effectiveness. And this is where, uh, um, and they want you to literally define the steps. Investigations, I think, is the last point. And here you say, according to your sterility failure, the most probable root cause for both events were laboratory error. We love invalidating sterility test lab error. And this has come to the, I, I told you that last year at the P FDA meeting, OOS came up and I knew they're going to look at OOS very closely. They are. They said, the inspector to the response said, you de-emphasize potential manufacturing causes. Here, on, on the, uh, our review of your outdoor specification, we found you lacked adequate procedures for investigating. Investigations are a gap all the time. And scientific justification to invalidate an OOS result. Following environmental uh, data errors, a typical reason to mandate is rate training. FDA is tired of retraining, okay? However, the industry in the FDA has gradually, it's gradually coming to the conclusion that this does not solve the problem. It just treats the symptoms, band-aid effect, and that human error will creep in again. 
this cannot be accomplished without adequate knowledge base and a holistic approach from facility design to product release. These are the things you always have to consider a comprehensive review of remediation plan of your OS result investigation system. The corrective action and preventive plan should include, but not limited to the following, that this is FDA's own words. Quality unit oversight of laboratory investigations. Quality unit should, don't let the laboratory run the show. Look if it is really a lab investigation or should it go back and it could be analytical and it could be microbiological, doesn't matter. Identification, adverse laboratory control trends. Trending is going to be the next. Resolution of uh, causes of lab variability, uh, manufacturing causes, inadequately scoping of each investigation and its cappers. I'm telling you, cappers are not going to, writing cappers do not resolve. Understanding the root cause and then have putting a kappa in place is the answer. Revised OOS investigation procedures and quality oversight, extremely important. So whose responsibility is this? Because you fail to correct repeat violation, we strongly encourage, we strongly recommend engaging a consultant qualified as set for, for uh, 21 CFR 21134. Your use of consultant does not relieve your firm's obligation to comply with the GMP. Just because we say we will use a consultant doesn't get us off the hook. Your firm's executive management remains responsible for resolving all deficiencies. So let's look at 21 CFR um, 21134. Look at what it's saying. It's not just sufficient education, training, or experiences. It's saying to advise on the subject for which they are retained. Let's say you have a cleaning validation issue and you call a compliance person. Do you think your issue will be resolved? Let's say you have a, a EM issues, right? And you are going to call a microbiologist, but the issues are with your, with your facility design. Do you think the microbiologist can re resolve that? You have to understand where the issues are and then retain the consultant. A comprehensive retrospect investigation to the extent of inaccuracies in data recording and reporting. Your assessment should include analysis of risk to patient caused by the release of drugs, risk posed by ongoing operations. So now they're saying, we don't want only 483 responses. We want you to assess the risk to patient, but also assess the risk to ongoing operations because we cited you. These are things that you have to uh, 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 look at, okay? A risk management program. You know, a lot of companies we go to, there are pages and pages and folders and folders and, and, and heaps and heaps of risk assessments. A risk management program starts with, and those are companies which also have 4 h 3 So what happened? What went wrong? Right? The risk management program starts with identifying the possible risk associated with the product or with the process used to develop uh, your manufacture or distribution of your product. Patient risk from contamination product should be the main premise of risk assessment, not how many pages not what tools you're using, FMEA, nobody cares what you're using. All they want is to look, are you, go, are you putting the patient at risk? Some of these tools are not applicable to us. <coughs> A lot of these tools came from NASA and food industry. It's all great, they're good tools, but you, we shouldn't get hung on the tools, right? The only alternative to risk management is crisis management, which is not only expensive, it's very embarrassing. Risk management is not about creating long, complex, and bureaucratic arrangements and piles of paper. It is about identifying what can go wrong, wrong and establishing practical steps to protect the patient. That is what the regulators want to see. Ignorance and indifference are the worst enemies. And the attitude of com complacence 
in spite of knowing something is not right, leads to risk mismanagement. You know something is not right. So this is a whole teamwork. Somebody sees something is not right, address it. We, we save a 483. Most disasters occur when there's obvious prior, prior warning and you will all agree with me of what could go wrong, right? But we ignored it for a variety of reasons. We're too busy. We don't have the manpower. We cannot keep up with these orders. This is something that I, I think that we are at the tipping point as an industry. We all are learning. There are no gurus. We all are learning. And if we if we follow this risk to patient as a premise for risk assessment, uh, knowledge base for uh, identifying root causes, and a commitment, I think we should be in good shape, okay? Third-party consultants at times are working from templates without knowledge of all aspects of client processes. Somebody, you know, we have, I tell all my clients, we have the knowledge base inside. All you need is to that spark to just start the discussion. If you all get together, we can, identify the root cause very easily. This documentation is neither, and sometimes, you know, uh, uh, groups will come do documenting. Some, sometimes it's just overkill. Just to implement that documentation, you need another army of people to implement it. So let's make it science-based. Let's make all our 483 responses science-based and attainable, right? Um, risk assessment must be more than paper compliance and must be taken seriously. And then there is no one fit all magical tool to identify all risks. Knowledge, knowledge, teamwork. I'm ready for questions. I think I went a little over time, but I wanted to really share all this uh, with the attendees, Uday. Great, great presentation, uh, Ziva. Uh, we will start with question and answers now. So Absolutely. I will read out. Yeah. So I request all the delegates and all the attendees to send your questions in the question tab, and we will try to answer most of your questions. So Ziva, here is the first, I think, a basic question, but I think you can uh, please address this. How do you differentiate between laminar flow and unidirectional flow? Laminar flow is uh, it's straight line all the time. Now. In your ramps or in your isolators, you don't have straight line all the time, right? There could be obstructions and and it, it doesn't go from the HEPA to the return in a straight line. And that is why uh, the engineering, um, engineering community is moving away from laminar and going to unidirectional. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, what do you think is the proportion of FDA observations uh, related to CSV and data integrity and how well are companies responding to them? I love this question. I commend whoever who asked it. We are uh, so focused. This question, uh, this question was asked by Anubha Mukherjee. Anubha, very good question. We are so focused on data integrity, but we are focused on data integrity and CSV computerized. A lot of data integrity happens outside the computerized systems, guys. We are humans. And yes, let's say, I, I don't like to use it, but I'm going to, I, you, I'm going to use it anyways. Garbage in, garbage out, right? If you fit, if you put garbage in your computer uh, system, right, your data will not be good. But where did this garbage initially, where did it start from? That is the key. You know, when we do data integrity audits, and I, I don't want to promote our services or anything of that sort, but when we do data integrity audits, we don't look at only CSV because that is only a small part. It's a small part. Data integrity starts somewhere else far away and it, it can start from operators it can start from design it can start from unvalidated methods it can start from deviations right 
and then that it goes into the computerized system. So we are saying, OK, you know what? We are going to have admin rights and nobody can go. No, was it that and correct in the first place? We don't look at Mukher Mr. Mukherjee, did I um, answer your Hello. question? No, uh, basically saying, do you have any figures on this? What is the proportion? No, I don't. I'm so sorry. I don't. OK, let's go to the next one. Uh, I think this is pretty basic. You know what? The, what is this question is? Uh, is bulk holding testing mandatory for CGMP, or will you get 483s if you don't do bulk hold bulk holding testing? Anything that you hold, right, is prone to contamination. Now I'm going to give you a very quick answer for this. We see this all the time. What is your proof? that your bulk will not contaminate, get contaminated. God forbid, God forbid, it gets contaminated by gram negative bacteria, right? You would, you might be able with your one or two uh, um, subsequent uh, point of micron filtration to remove the bacteria, but what have you left behind? Endotoxin, which cannot be removed by your filters. So it is a very good practice. And okay. it is expected, yes. Uh, the next one is, uh, can extended LAF reduce risk of contamination due to operator? It's a big design issue, right? It's a big, I, I showed you some, right? You can have extended LAF, right? But then you can have open wraps. You have done nothing. And, and 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 people do like extended LAF to tell you honestly, but then uh, I, I'm just going to give you this example from a meeting with a client this morning. My engineering team was meeting with them, and what was happening? And I'm I really want to let me tell you that I don't mind answering all the questions. I don't mind how long it takes. Sure, but. Um, so what was happening is they had an extended LAF, OK? And they had wraps. And what, and, but it, it, the way the air was pushing, getting pushed out of the extended LAF, it was at a faster speed than the wraps. So, air velocity, um, the, the air changes, all these have to be calculated. That's an engineering question. Um, but, uh, I can get this answered by my engineer. Uh, if you can shoot this, um, uh, shoot this um, question to me uh, on an email over there. Yeah, so you can just announce your email, Ziva. Z Abraham, Z as in Ziva, Z as we say in India, Abraham, A B R A H A M at Micro right M I C R O R I T E dot com. Great. Now I'll go to the next question. Go ahead. Okay. This is really, uh, I don't know. Okay. Many companies allow reuse of sterile garments in between breaks by keeping them under HIPAA filtered air in garment cubicle. Actually, garment should be changed. Uh, actually, garment should be changed every work session. Any FDA 483 on this? Yes, but not this year. Okay, there have been in the past garment change. You cannot use the same garments. You cannot. You know, this is very interesting that this he asked this question. We saw this in an audit. We were doing a. Uh, pre-approval uh, audit uh, in Southeast Asia, and they, they thought they were technologically, by the way, the email is right here. Uh, you can see on the screen. Why is this jumping? So what they did is they put it under HEPA filter there, okay? Uh, they, you even get HEPA cards for garment storage. You can buy them. And, and uh, we, at least, you know, my XFDA, I have an XFDA inspectors in my team, and he said, if you haven't, if you haven't understood that these garments are the filthiest because you have already worn them for four hours, and you are going to take these filthy garments in. 
So to answer your question, every time you go in, you have to wear a new garment because there will be millions of organisms there. Great. Next one is, is I, uh, you know, this ISP documents like GAMP, GAMP and others, are they guidelines or are they regulations? They are not regulations. They are publications. Great. Uh, okay, now this is a, a very basic one, but you still can answer. Where I can I find uh, where can I find FDA warning letters and 483 observations? So FDA puts out they have a whole Excel sheet on observations. Uh, www.fda.gov gov. They've changed their website before. It used to be very user friendly. But there are also other software. If you're a large company, you can always uh, uh, look for those software. Um, there are softwares that um, they actually provide you a constant feed of 483s who, who, uh, who actually issued them and so on and so forth. One of them is, uh, oh my God, I, I keep on remembering, FDA aware. Okay, great. Uh, so here, uh, another question is on purified water. Uh, what what is the uh, what what is the frequent US FDA observation on purified water system in 2019? Means, uh, basically, are there any FDA this, you know observations on purified water systems? Yeah, I uh, saw one on for, uh, on uh, uh, biofilms. I have not seen each one of them, but water is critical and and there was one on maintenance let me talk a little more about this okay because this is something that is as i told you we all are learning not only the clients not only the fda i'm telling you i'm i'm learning so much from the investigations and the warning letter remediation fda uh, responses um people think that you know uh, if they can uh, i don't know why this is jumping non-stop So uh, a lot of times people think that, you know what, uh, I, once I put a, a system, I have a tank, right, for my purified water uh, or whatever water I'm using, it's going to be good forever. Um, maintenance of the, tam, a ta, uh, of the tanks and testing is very important. Again, uh, Passivation is important, and this is very new to the industry. We do it, but it's very new to the industry. Is uh, rouge profiling? Uh, it's it's not common commonplace, but we do that. Sometimes the you know we are not even aware of how much rouge we have in the tanks unless they are, you know, uh, a plastic or some kind of that material, the stainless steel. That rouge profiling. Uh, uh, starts building as rouge builds up uh, biofilms build up and that is why they they want you to after all you know you use your purified water maybe for your autoclave you use it as feed water for your stills right you don't want gram negatives or uh, biofilms that uh, in in that water uh, because those biofilms will eventually cause endotoxin the other point I wanted to bring, and this is for you to start thinking about it, you know, you know, we don't test everything. If we were to test uh, actinomycetes in our environmental monitoring, we would not release one product. Why don't we test my actin? There are as many actinomycetes in the, in the soil as there are bacteria or fungi, but actinomycetes take about six weeks minimum to to grow. We don't have that kind of patience and it is not being tested. So really the testing we do is really minimum. We shouldn't be seeing so many issues. The other thing that the hospital industry started realizing this about five, six years back, that their water, their purified water systems used to have mycobacteria, not the ones causing TB, not these are called non-tuberculous mycobacteria, like the Mycobacterium shaloni or mycogenicum groups. Those we cannot test. And I have seen 
I've not seen a 483 a go, uh, uh, for this, but I've seen media fill failures and sterility test failures with mycobacteria because they are sort of facultative anaerobes. They grow in FTM. So uh, specifically, I cannot pinpoint you to any 483s regarding water systems. The one that I put there, was, that was about water systems and, and, and the biofilm formation. Okay, thank you, Viva. The next one is about uh, air velocity. What is the velocity expected in the LAF till the table? <laughs> this is a question when Morgan talks, you talk to him. Uh, uh, there is, I, you know, I don't know. So there is a, there's a white paper on our website on air velocity measurement versus uh, a smoke study. Uh, those are guidance doc, that's guidance value. And not everybody can reach guidance value. Some people say, you know what, I'm going to test it at six inches from the open phase. I'm going to test it at work surface. Well, what is your work height? I think you will get, uh, I think it's somewhere. No, I haven't put it. I can share with, uh, I can send it to you then. You can share it with your audience. I don't mind. Just, just for the audience, uh, uh, I'm interrupting the question answer session that all our webinars are given on our website, uh, www.ispindia.net. We have several webinars planned in the month of April and May. Every Saturday there is one. So you can visit this website, which I put on the chat, and you can register for all the webinars which are there, whichever you find interesting. So let's go to the next question now. I must say, you, you chose some very fascinating topics, okay, Ude, for your webinars. Thanks, Ivan. Thank you, uh, the next one is uh, independent assessment, okay. Uh, what is What does independent assessment mean? Can organization do independence assessment with cross-functional teams within the organization and submit a report? As you have mentioned, knowledge is there within the organization. So independent, when FDA says independent assessment, they, they want you to use consultants, in short, consulting company. But again, you have to understand, independent assessment doesn't mean that you can hire a compliance person and he will solve all your issues, right? The people who right cappers cannot solve your issues so independent so let me give you my two cents okay um, you know i always tell people sometimes you need somebody to show you the direction they don't need to do the work for you am i making sense uh, yeah when we are working in a company we are so so bogged down with our daily activities one of the things that my my team and I am against this that I I don't like people sitting for two three years working at a client site. When you when somebody is do being there, you become a part of the organization. Independent means outside eye to look at to point you in the right direction. Then you have your data, you have your knowledge base. I'm telling you, we we do this all the time, and I'm. I'm appalled that there is so much knowledge, just you need that spark, somebody to give you the smug. You don't need somebody to do the work for you. You need to somebody to show you, you know, this is what it is, and then you can resolve it. So that is what I mean by independent assessment. But when FDA says independent assessment, they expect you to hire consultants, period. And it's right. up to you whether you want to do paper compliance or fix the issues. That's your choice. Okay. The next one is, is there anything advanced technology over RABS? Isolators, but nothing unless I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something. Okay. Uh, it's a common joke uh, uh, in my team. And we always tell our clients, I said, you know, you come home uh, and your wife says, why didn't you do the uh, dishes? And you say, honey, you never told me to. If you don't know what you want and if you don't give your instructions and expectations in terms of a good URS to your technology uh, supplier, 
What are you going to get? Off the shelf. We see these issues all the time. We uh, 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 do FATs, AFTs, uh, SATs, and the gap is in URS. You have to tell, tell, you have to decide what technology is suited. Do you think grabs are not good? No, they're all good. It's better than open clean rooms. But if you can get an isolator and you don't uh, define your user requirements best and you get off the shelf, you have come with the same, <coughs> it comes with the same uh, problems as a RAMS. It's a much, it's much more expensive technology, but you have to decide your process, what equipment you're going to do inside your airflows. You have to check, you should be a big part of the, the SAT, FAT, don't accept something off the shelf. If you define it, make sure that you get what you define. So your early, early th thinking together is, is very important. Great. Thanks. I hope I answered the question. Yes, yes, yes. The next one is about CFR and regulations. In general, the CFR states that what is required, but they do not state how how to do it uh, and uh, for uh, you know for how to do it you refer to pda and isp guidelines then how do we address these you know you had made some comment that uh, uh, cfr is actual regulations and pda and isp are guidelines so is a question i think more explanation on that yeah this is very important so let's let's look at uh, the CFR. CFRs are very general, okay? I'm sure that there are some non-sterile people here. I'm going to give a non-sterile example here. What does a CFR say? You shall not have objectionable microorganism, right? You shall yes. not have objectionable microorganism in your product. And especially in non-sterile product, it is the sponsor's responsibility to identify the objectionable. Nowhere can you get it. You can't get it. This is where you have to understand <clears throat> you you are meeting the regulation, but to meet the regulation, you should know where to go and get the information. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's right. OK, the next one is about method validations. Uh, the question is, can you please provide some recent observations on analytical method validation for 83s i don't have them but i will ask my analytical people to look up okay okay uh next one is about facility design uh, facility design are qualified including filters and laf where do you think where we are failing to qualify the design i don't know yeah, yeah, the question. yeah. Uh, I understood that you know that this is a common issue. I told you, right? Yeah. So we qualify. I have to tell you, and it's unfortunate that we, first of all, we don't choose the right, uh, I mean, we don't write a good URS, right? And then we go and qualify through templates. We do our IQ, OQ, PQ, and we, we thought we have qualified it. But IQ, OQ, PQ using templates is very easy to qualify. But then we come to realize, oh my God, when we've done IQ, OQ, PQ, we've uh, done a smoke study, right? And we say, oh, it's not all that good. Then I, I'm not going to get into details of smoke study. Please attend the Morgan's. Uh, you will understand where the, where the issue becomes. The connection between the qualification and the smoke study, he will identify, he will explain it to you. So what we are doing is we are still working with templates, right? Uh, IQ, OQ, PQ, yes, we got whatever parts we ordered, where we got the equipment we ordered. It is giving us the air velocity that we needed. Then we come to uh, uh, IQ, OQ, PQ. We do not understand integration, right? What is integration? We qualify everything piecemeal we qualify our rabs isolator as a unit we qualify the clean room as a unit right 
when you integrate both these, that's where the interaction happens. I showed you, right? Peter, uh, Peter stealing from Paul, right? P stealing from Peter to pay Paul. If we would have qualified this part or done an investigational smoke study up front, we would have said, how can we qualify this? We cannot. Uh, if my grade B area is not getting any air and everything is being stolen by the rabs, then my grade B will fail. But in my qualification, it is passing. And that is the disconnect. Great. Uh, let's go to the next one. It is, what is your thought on manufacturing in gray space? Industry talk about closed systems, closed processing, single use technology, etc. What is gray space? Uh, probably it would be a non non because it could be non classified space. <laughs> I don't think we should manufacture any any medicinal product that goes to humans or animals in non controlled areas. Okay, let's go to the next one. What is the hierarchy of documents? Example: regulations, standards expert opinion, published papers, etc. What else do we have as source of research? This is a fantastic question. So, first comes regulations, okay? CFRs and UNX, right? Then we look at, let's, let me just give you a very good example, okay? Let's say I am uh, I'm looking at your facility should be of appropriate design, right? Uh, one of the CFR uh, subparts, right? Where do I go for my facility? Next, I go to standards, right? What standards will I use? I will use ISO 14644 whole series 1 to 14, right? Not just 14644-1. Then I have to understand, I want to do IQ, OQ, PQ, right? I'm just giving an example. But my IQ, OQ, PQ is not written, is written where? There are two places. I'll explain to you. In Annex 1, you have, in, in EU, you have Annex 15 for your qualification, right? So what trumps is Annex 15, if you are following Annex 1, right? Annex 15. Or let's say you're only, you, you don't make any product, MHRA will never come to your door. Where do you go for? That's when you go and you say, okay, what are reliable, pure published, right, sources? USP doesn't tell you anything about validation. So I could go to ISPE, which is engineering. They have great, great sources. If it is microbiology related, I might go to microbiology. Uh, I may go to reference, but it has to be peer reviewed. You always look first for a standard, any standard from an industry organization that could be IES, uh, IEST uh, or AAMI or ISO, right? That's your next step. And then you go to qualified and uh, organization, ISPE for engineering, right? Uh, for microbiology, it could be PDA. Then you go to books. Books are also public opinion, but there are good books. So you have to know who are the experts in this area. Let, let's say if I have to think about particle counting or let's say I, I want to think about clean room design, okay? I'm, I'm thinking about clean room design. Who who better than ASHRAE for clean room design? Who is better than ASHRAE? ASHRAE is the HVAC society, right? You go to, to ASHRAE's design guide. It tells you all the details. The details, I just gave a small amount. That tells you all the details, what, how the pressure differentials change, uh, when you open the door, um, the delta, how the delta drops, all that. So you should need, know the organizations, the top organizations, and their focus. And that's where you should go first. Great. Would that, did I answer the question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, now, this is about fumigation. How to defumigate area after fogging, uh, after fogging 
without entering outside air in clean area or during fogging whole time defumigate so every equipment so you know when you buy a fogging equipment it could be marcor it could be uh, whatever there are so many technologies out there those there are a lot of things you have to consider when you are uh, first of all never use glutaral gl if you're still doing glut glutaral gl please walk away from it. it's highly carcinogenic um so you could be using a paa chemistry or hydrogen ionized hydrogen peroxide or whatever every equipment comes with instructions for multiple things you cannot take a one fogger and fog, fog the old area they have a calculation of how many how many square meters or square feet you can fog per equipment you cannot take that equipment from place to place you must have this enough calculated calculate the area and have that equipment second thing is your nozzle placement the nozzle direction if you are a piece of equipment with one nozzle only you're going to only fumigate one part the third part is they have their own requirement sometimes they will need humidity sometimes they will want you to shut off your air handlers right and most of the time uh, there is an aeration period and after the aeration period there is a test method and every uh, every equipment you use for fogging or fumigation should have a test method to ensure that you uh, you know it, it should tell you this is how long your aeration period should be after the aeration period is over you can go and test it Great. did i answer the question uday yes yes absolutely so let's go to the next one now uh, this is about the first air what you spoke how to resolve the problem of the first air not meeting or touching the equipment parts during dynamic studies it's a common and this is all uh, again this is all design issues and integration issues so uh, during dynamic studies you don't do it because now you're opening the door and your air velocity inside could be lower and one outside could be higher or you could have this inlet issues uh, those are uh, or just recently uh, we saw a company that decided that they will have return ducts only on one wall what do you think happened horrible horrible turbulence as soon as you open the door because the air where there were no return ducts was going where directly into the ramps uh, because there was nothing else pulling it so it, it it depends upon a lot of things the placement of your helpers the placement of the returns the velocity in the enclosure the velocity outside and so on and so forth I hope that helps. Great. Uh, now this is about uh, the timing and commitment what you give when you are answering in 483. Mm. Is seeking extension appropriate once committed and what could be the timeline that can be requested? This is something you have to think upfront, okay? There are circumstances. Sometimes, uh, let's, let's take this COVID scenario, okay guys? Uh, you think people are not asking for extension everybody's asking for extension they're working at 40 percent 20 percent 40 percent capacity but uh, if you put a good reason to satisfy the fda you know we are asking an invest uh, extension because we are looking at more than what we committed to to make sure that there is product quality that is okay but just because we uh, we are asking an extension because we don't know how to do the root cause. We don't know the root cause. We're still fumbling. That doesn't fly very well. Okay. Okay. Uh, whether CRAB is recommended in pharma due to uh, derm dermatis mentioned in your seminar? I don't understand this question. I don't know if you can understand. <laughs> See if C rab the closed wraps are better than open wraps. Period. You know it's good that a wraps has its own air supply. It's much better than taking air from the Great B area. So, uh, op closed wraps are much better than open wraps. Okay. Uh, uh, you only talked 
uh, about sterile operations. What about non-sterile operations for 83s? I love that question. You know, uh, actually, I like non-sterile more than sterile, whoever that question asked. Uh, non-sterile operations. Let me give you a very good scenario. You know, we one of the things we do globally is pathogen specific assessments. My team uh, is qualified because of the cl clinical um, background and all. Non-sterile is going to be so, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but very soon you will see a non-sterile guidance from the FDA. And I, I, I don't want to tell you about my involvement, but um, we are, we saw with the COVID, right? We saw with the COVID what happened. Organism that was actually animal born became human born. No problem, right? Organisms do not discriminate. They, they evolve. I always tell people that uh, we think fast, but bugs, uh, bugs evolve fast. So from the time in the 70s, when I was a young scientist, uh, aspergillosis uh, was a lung disease of the pigeons. Today, more than 50% of uh, immune compromised uh, patients die from aspergillosis. And actually, it is going to become uh, the focus of the regulators very soon. That even if, if you looked at the uh, New England pharmacy, three of the mold um, uh, that were discovered that killed 70 people and made 600 sick, they never were human pathogens and they became human pathogens. So it is very important. I think the, the awareness, even with regulators, will increase in a year, year and a half. And I can't give you too many details, but it is very important that we look at that uh, seriously. Um, and one of the examples that we have a book coming out, Practical Contamination Control, book coming out this year. Uh, and one of my case studies is, let's say I have a nasal product and I've got a place, uh, somebody said gray area, right? I've got a place in my in the warehouse and I said, I'm going to take a modular clean room, put it there. It's a non-style, who cares? Now, what am I doing? Non a nasal product. Nasal product means you have the biggest risk for mold contamination. I told you 50% or more die. Now you take in the warehouse, you have pallets, cardboard, you're taking all the mold into it, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you put a C CRABS or a BSC, you are still going to get that contamination in there. So those are the things you have to think upfront. What is objectionable in my organism? I mean, in my product, what is the mode of administration? And then what kind of controls I need? Great. Uh, let's go to the next one. There are many questions, Eva, but I think That's we'll okay. answer them briefly. Yeah. There are organizations struggling with data integrity issue observations. The main concerns are related to the response and impact assessment of the issues identified. What should yes. be considered for impact assessment and CAPA for any uh, intentional data integrity issue? Wow, this is a very interesting question. This is a very interesting question. As I told you, Data integrity did not, not, people don't want to do data integrity, trust me. We all want to do that. There are two things, and I, I don't know how I can say it in the most politically correct manner. We have to, we have to empower our, our operators, and we have to give them the right tools. Try to understand why that data integrity. Uh, we've been de dealing with data integrity issues for six years, more than six years, right? And most of the time, the data integrity has come out because we have not given our operators or our, our uh, analysts the right tools, right? Uh, and that is where it is coming from. If we give them the right tools, we will not have the data integrity. Nobody wants to do it. And firing people and hiring new people is not the answer. Retraining is not the answer. We have to get to the root cause of data integrity and abolish it once and for all. And it's not difficult. It's not difficult. See, one of the specific things what he has asked is, I mean, how will you do impact assessment? And what 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 would be the kind of kappa? I think kappa you have answered, but impact assessment. 
a bad assessment, they actually want you to look at how far, how long have, do you have data integrity and how many batches have it, has it affected? Okay. Uh, let's go this. All, all issues which have we have discussed, is there solution provide in regulatory or guidelines? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no, no. What I am teaching you is from our experience. This is something we deal with too. You will need to spend two years uh, understanding design. Trust me, I don't know. I have design engineers working for me. I still don't understand half the uh, half the step jargon that they talk about. This is where I, you know, I, I, I had to tell you something. And uh, when people say we are giving compliance, and I tell them, what do you mean by we are giving compliance? That word should be abolished. We are resolving issues. That is what we have to, this is not something, that's why you get the, FDA says that you have to get the right expertise. If you get the wrong expertise, you will be closing capas and opening capas. See, this is a company that got caught for data integrity, okay? Well, uh, we got called in and, uh, um, I looked at it, I don't understand. I don't understand this design. I, I know a little bit, whatever I learned, okay? I mean, there's more to it. I can understand some part now. And I said, I have nothing, I, I have nothing to offer you. I'm a microbiologist. Why did you call me? This is a design issue because this is what I learned from my engineers, right? So my engineer went there, they already, were people closing capas and their issue was what? Was design issue and that design issue led to data integrity. So getting the right expertise is very important. Great. Uh, now this is uh, this question is specifically about your slide number 15. Oh In God. slide 15, do you think uh, don't think I mean you should also consider kappa extrapolation across sites i think this is something with your kappa and yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be different. yeah yeah this is this is one right positive consumer responding to uh, observations yes. yeah correct correct yeah you they will expect you uh, across sites so this is very very good question because as many of the times you said oh no 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 our unit 7 got 483s but unit 3s is um is good we didn't got <coughs> oh, i love this question i'm telling you it just makes me chuckle here uh, but the unit three has so unit six got 483s but unit three is good we our unit three is good we don't need to look at it but the unit three has the same design so the uh, when your unit three got inspected your inspector was not not well worse uh, as well worse as the inspector in unit six, correct? So you are right. You look at those issues across the board, across the board. A very good question. Very good question. Uh, the next one is difference. What is the difference between sterile and aseptic technique? There is no sterile technique. Even when we say sterile product manufactured by aseptic technique, there is no assurance of sterility right aseptic is what without introducing organisms but we call our product sterile which is a misnomer okay let's go to the next one uh, people are, ta are talking advantages of operator safety by avoiding cleaning and sanitization of electrical wires near or in wraps how does FDA look at this issue? I don't think FDA has ever talked about it. Okay. But to remember, if there are electrical wires, cleaning is important. Cleaning is important, especially these days with a lot of robotics in isolators and now also in RABs. There is a lot of electric wires. And if you don't clean and your airflows are not good, uh, good. I have to tell you this. This is a good question. So do you know the electric wires have some kind of coating, right? Some kind of rubber coating 
oh, Mo loves that. There is a very old 483. This is 20 years back that FDA literally found um, that their electrical socket was a little, the screw was missing. So they opened up the screw and behind, behind that they saw the electric wires all fuzzy. And this, this uh, company had recalled products with mold contamination and there was mold growing on electric wires. This is a really good question. Okay, Uday, we are getting very good questions here. Thanks. Okay, I think next one is a follow-up question. You know, somebody had asked about laminar flow and unidirectional flow. So th this is a follow-up question on that. So what should be the flow of HIPAA, whether it should be unidirectional flow or laminar flow? It is unidirectional. Okay. Uh, uh, you said the average human shed around 10,000 CFU per hour, but as you can see, they are in gown. Then how does it affect the air quality since they are covered? Okay, so on an average, th that is with gowns. That is a study by Ryan Miller, Linquist, and well, White, right? Without the gown, let me tell you how much we shed. We shed three kilograms of skin per year. And per uh, millimeter of skin, there are millions of microorganisms. So again, depending upon the filter efficacy of your gown and your gowning procedures, you can, they're saying with a very good gowns, right? You can still shed uh, uh, 10,000 microorganisms uh, per hour. You have to understand microorganisms are not always uh, 0.2 micron or 0.3 micron. If you ever go to Paul Corporation's website, you will see that there are organisms that can even pass through 0.1 micron filter. So there are many things that happen. These are not stuck to our body. We still have air outlets as we are moving. So as well as we gown, microorganisms can still come out. Great. Thank you. The yeah. next one is about kappa uh, some, and root cause. Sometimes it is difficult to find root cause, difficult to close kappa. Oh, In yes. that case, how do you define with FD and how do you uh, respond to an 483? I think many, many would have this, uh, this question in their mind. That is correct. That one of the reasons you cannot find the root cause because you don't know what it is. I my example of that facility, right? That uh, had uh, had a data integrity of uh, uh, environmental monitoring plates and uh, personnel monitoring plates, right? They they had an army of consultants sitting, writing kappas and closing kappas, right? No root cause. And they repeat, 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 operator training, operator training, operator training. Till uh, my engineer said, no, this is a facility design issue. Every time you're opening the door, actually the air is going over to the person. And uh, plus uh, uh, a lot of the surface monitoring plates uh, were not doing good too. This is knowledge base, and that is where it's important to understand, are you really looking at the real cause? Now, that being said, I always say that in my, especially in micro, I, I'll talk microbiology because I'm a microbiologist. In microbiology, um, uh, uh, CAPAs and the, uh, 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 investigations, a smoking gun may not be the murder weapon. So mm -hmm. I always tell when people say, oh, I think it is this. Uh, no, it may not be a murder weapon. So are you really looking for the murder weapon or the smoking gun? And that comes when you look at things holistically. If you are going to look at only operators or you are going to only look at the gowning, or you're going to look at only the labs or the aseptic behavior, you will not identify the real issue. And that is why it becomes very difficult to close capas. Great. Uh, now this is another one. How much gap is allowed between two HIPAA filters in filling area? You, know, you made a thing about uh, there was too much gap in two HIPAA filters. That's why you have uh, diffuser membranes you cover those gaps, you get unidirectional flow. 
Right. You always have a frame, right? You always have, you will, otherwise how are you going to put your HEPA filters? But then you, together, you need directional airflow. There is something called diffuser membranes. But A, you have to really take care of those diffuser membranes. We saw just recently at a company, uh, the diffuser membrane was literally torn for in one area and you could see eddy currents in that area. Luckily, it was not over open product. Great. Uh, now, what is the required path length between inlet duct and return riser? Uh, what is the required path length between inlet duct and return riser? Oh, I have no idea. I don't think that is all engineering, okay? I cannot answer that question. Okay, I don't think great. there is any path. You have to uh, make the uh, measurements. You have to make the measurements, air velocity measurements, um, air exchange rate measurements, and airflow uh, airflow studies That's to right. make That's sure right. that it, it it is being cleaned. Sometimes, That's and I'm going to tell you one of the one of the facilities that we are retrofitting. Uh, they they had return risers. They were not literally. Uh, there were no not low return risers. They were in the walls, and that really created a whole bunch of new issues. So just reducing the height of the returns helped a lot. I'm going to give you another uh, example. You know, this is a really good group, uh, Uday. One of the issues that we see in India is we love. Uh, uh, monitoring near return rises. We spent, my my team has spent so much time cutting that off because that is that creates unnecessary excursions which leads to data integrity. That is something that people don't understand. But now if you're used to doing that, to cut it off, you have to write a good justification and remove that. I, I always tell people, are you? I didn't know that you're making your product in your return duct. Why are you measuring near the return duct? It will be dirty anyway. So now they get excursions and that leads to a data integrity. And there are 483 from a lot of Indian companies where they got hit for data integrity because they were getting um, hits uh, on in the plates near the return ducts. But you will get the hits. Why did you put them there in the first place? <laughs> and then we go and and then there are consultants who will come and say, oh, no, no, you cannot have it flat. You have to have an angle. Doesn't matter. You don't need uh, plates there. That is dirty anyway. And that is not a critical control point. That is your return duct. All that you are shedding is going to go there. Anyways, thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, now, this is about investigations. Investigation is such an area, whatever you do, other person can have different view. What is your guidance here? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, if you are scientifically sound, do not accept any other view. Okay? People work from sometimes from a limited knowledge. A lot of, especially microbiology investigation, and uh, they say, oh, we are going to do DE study. And I tell them, I just throw away those DE studies. They're not. Get the root cause, your issue will be resolved. It's not just cleaning related. So first of all, see that your investigation is scientifically sound. And if it is scientifically sound, then I don't think you should budge from your point of view. OK, great. Uh, now, next one is about material flow and personal flow. Uh, is it possible to handle material flow and personal flow through one door between corridor and process room? I see some consultants only give one door. I don't know if you understand this question. Yeah, yeah I understood. What he's saying is uh, one way in, one way out. That's what he's saying. For yeah. aseptic, you are required, and if you look at the 2020, you, uh, the draft, it's clearly saying that it has to be one way. But there are aging. Remember that we have aging facilities. Not only do we have one, uh, uh, one way for materials, um, personnel to go in, and same way to for personnel to come out, but we also have the same room, same gowning or airlock for materials and 
personnel to go and come out and sometimes even waste. So per Annex 1, the 2020 that came out two months back, uh, uh, it's, it's clarified that you need to have a separate one, one way in, one way out for personnel. There's another issue that we are seeing and sometimes we say, oh, no, 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 we have, uh, we have passed through. Uh, FDA is looking at pass-throughs too now, um, and especially the Annex 1 has really clarified pass-throughs. We see so many issues in pass-throughs. It's, it's, uh, uh, if you're aseptic, I mean, passive pass-throughs don't do anything for us. You need to have active pass-throughs, and those pass-throughs have to be smoke-tested, because if you have leaks from the pass-throughs, you have done nothing having that uh, kind of segregation. Right. Uh, now, this is about a software. Is there a right software solution available in the market for handling EM, I think environmental monitoring? You know, many are available, right? Moda and Novatech. Many, many yeah. years back, EM Sciences built the first software. I worked on it. I actually consulted for these software companies too. Um, and then it was bought by BD and they got killed. Then you had the Pilgrim, then you had uh, Novatech, and then you had uh, um, uh, then you had uh, Moda. And I think there's an Indian company too that has uh, uh, EM software or a cleaning validation software. I, I have to remember which that Indian company is. Okay, great. Uh, now, whatever we discussed about garment, is this applicable for non-sterile API plant as well? You, you should. If you're going to gar garbing, if you're garbing, it is to pro pro either it is to pro protect the product or it is to protect the uh, product the operator, right? You cannot keep on uh, wearing the same gown. And if you look at uh, CC003.4, there's a whole table for what grades, what garments uh, you should be choosing. It'll be really helpful for you. Great. Uh, what is your opinion on recording interventions by another person viewing filling room operations from outside of the filling room instead of operator recording directly? Any FDA observations on such a practice? Observing what? Uh, uh, probably the you know filling operations or whatever operations are going on. Yeah. And no, observing basically interventions. So his question is, what is your opinion on recording interventions by another person viewing filling room operations from outside of the filling room? instead of the operator recording the intervention directly any fda observation on such recording, a recording recording means what uh, it must be video recording is it video recording or you are recording them on your media field or production batch record i think this could be video recording you don't you cannot <laughs> I, I don't i don't know what 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 he means by recording are you talking about cctv yeah, could be. Yeah, CCTV. Oh, the very if it's CCTV is a very interesting question because um, FDA has uh, found that the CCTV cameras are are positioned in such a way that you see the back of the operator and not what the operator is doing. Uh, there are 483s related to CCTV, not in 2019, but before that. So if you're uh, CCTV and uh, Sometimes um, Indian companies keep CCTV on and sometimes they get into trouble for that. But it, it's very important that we know through CCTV is the best training tool for your operators, really. We, we have done this for uh, many companies, not only in India. Um, we use your T CCTV recording to do operator, uh, explain to them, what they're doing, why they're doing, why they're so important. It's very important to tell the operators they are the most important, and they are. And then we use the CCTV recording, and then we tell them, show us your aseptic deficiencies here. And trust me, they actually show each other's aseptic. That's the best training tool. 
Right. Uh, if we move for more automated system setups in plant, can we expect the reduction of the 483 as everything is handled by computerized systems? What is your opinion on that? Again, can you repeat that, please? Sure. If we move, means if we use more automated systems in the plant, can we expect a reduction in 483s? That is, you know, if we go for more automation and more computerized system. No, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you don't design it well and you don't maintain it well. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, which non-ionic surfactant to be recommended for effective cleaning? Cleaning of what? Uh, I mean, if suppose if it is equipment or if it is basically, I think so, it should be equipment only. So you know, you have your uh, you have your phenolics. Phenolics are great, uh, but they are not sporicidal agent. They have a surfactant in it. Phenolics, quartz, I'm not a fan of because they promote gram-negative growth. Um, if you can find phenolic compounds, they're fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gram-negative organisms is observed during monitoring, then it is important to investigate thoroughly. I have gone through one of these investigations during audit. In my view, investigations are always be subjective. View of individual can differ. Then why FDA doesn't think in this way? I think this looks like a follow-up question. Yeah. No, they, they are looking at uh, patient risk connected to okay. the organism, and that's what they are... Uh, their focus is. Okay. So it is not more personal thing. It is basically the patient risk. It's, it's is always, being... always, you know, investigations are the, is, is the biggest gap anywhere. Because we, sometimes you will have a 30 page uh, investigation and, and, and it never ends in patient risk. Is it, is it risky to the patient? Nobody talks about it. Right. Right. Absolutely right. How process simulation study is conducted for ophthalmic ointment of aluminum collapsible tubes? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I need to, you need to repeat that. Okay, uh, this is about process simulation study and how is it conducted for ophthalmic ointments uh, uh, which are filled in aluminum collapsible tubes? Well, this is very specific. I cannot, I don't know the specifics. I can't answer this question. Okay, great. Next one. What are the expectations from regulators on the uh, human error as identified root cause? Uh, they are very, they are very, very. So, you know, we saw that we always say human error and training and retaining. So they're very suspicious of it. Yep. Uh, did FDA discourage the use of open grabs? Not yet. Okay. They in expect you to understand. They need, expect you to understand. In multi-product facility of OSD and general formulation facility, can we combine different process room in one AHU with terminal HIPAA filters in supply duct? That's an engineering question because it depends upon what product you have. Uh, you know, OSD facilities uh, have very little controls, but they have their own challenges, right, of the powders and all. So that is a very, very detailed engineering without details. I mean, I, even I'm not capable of answering that. Right. Any 483s regarding pure steam and steam sterilizers? Oh, there are tons. There are tons because a lot of times they're looking at your steam sterilizer validation your load configurations and so on and so forth and then okay. your water quality yes this is again another follow-up from the same person i am interested to know your views about human errors if company already have adequate system control design control training then also human errors occur in such a case how we can respond to fda, FDA observations so let me you know, tell you this. I, I, let me explain this a little more in detail one of the things is, uh, and, and this is what we're seeing in India all the time, and uh, my India uh, consultant deals with this all the time. Sometimes we don't segregate 
our deviations or our excursions, whatever else. Okay, these are events. These are lab errors. Uh, this is a deviation, this is a uh, excursion, and this is an OOS. And we put them all together, and then we treat them all with the same severity, right? If you upfront decide this kind of things that happen are not severe, they don't have product impact, right? Then it reduces the own, oh, it doesn't become so onerous for you to try to investigate everything. So the level of investigation for things that are not relevant to things that are serious has to differ. Correct, correct, very true. Uh, next one, during the instrument qualification, URS is necessary to, is URS necessary to comply CGMPs? URS is what you decide, right? And you decide for your requirements, your process requirements, right? The CGMP comes in your qualification part. The URS comes in your choice and engineering part. Okay. You mentioned we have to consider regulatory requirements while preparing a response, but most of the cases, the requirements are not specific from regulatory. How to manage? And that is the same thing I told you. Look at what the regulations say. Look, next, what standards are your standards correct? Let's say, for example, no, it's not a good example. Uh, I, I, we didn't, we didn't do a maintenance of our, uh, of our uh, HEPA filters, correct? So I, we just did filter integrity test, nothing else. We did it once in two years. Well, where is the regulation? There is no regulation. It, it, regulation just says, hey, maintain your facility. Where do I go next? I go to my standards. So where is the standard? If I look at 14644-3, which is 2015, well, it was not accepted by USA. So for US FDA, that doesn't apply. But MHRA has clear um, clear guidance on uh, on what tests you should be doing for maintenance in the Annex 1. So you should know how to maneuver between the standards and guidances. And you should also know what is happening with these standards all the time. Yeah, basically, again, it goes to the knowledge. Yeah. Okay, next one is on this. What's the science to establish sanitization frequency for purified water and water for injection? Okay, that is a big question. That's a big question. That is a loaded question. Your sanitization and your sanitizer, it all depends on your, again, you have to do risk assessment. You have to understand what your system's capability is. Oh, you have to think about your piping length. You might have five miles of piping. It might need more cleaning. Your ports may get uh, biofilms, right? And we always blame the operator because there's a contamination, blame the operator, easy. So it, it all, you have to do risk assessment and understand which will be, uh, um, and you take your historical data, okay? Right. If the same one, if the water system is stopped for interim period, what is the recommended least least oh, water quality? Oh my God! Don't stop that system. You have biofilms. First, check for biofilms before you even start. We had a client um, that started a brand new facility, got a water system, started the water system, uh, uh, qualified it, stopped it for six months, and after six months, it was mucky water. So that is something you don't do because stagnant water is the basis for biofilm formation. Great. Uh, risk assessment is a vast subject. How can we tackle observations on inadequate risk assessment? <laughs> Again, it comes back to knowledge base. If you know where the problem lies, risk assessment is very easy. If you're going to use just uh, paper risk assessment, you will never get to the real problem. Uh, if you fight over FMEA or HACCP or HAZOP, it may not lead you to the right. Um, I wish I can share the chapter, but that book is going to get published in fall. You have to start with the knowledge base for risk assessment. 
And I think I've given you a lot of uh, good information here for some part. I wish this was a two day seminar, but it's, it's a one hour. No, it's not a one hour. We've been... <laughs> no, that's a very good. I, I, I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll organize one half day seminar on, uh, uh, on a different day. Okay, the next one is, uh, I hope we can take a few more questions or should we stop uh, here? No, 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 it's okay though. I'm here to help. Okay, great. Can one AHU share different classification? I don't know what this means. Is provide air for different classification. Oh yeah, people do that. People do that. It depends on the size, right? Yeah, and then okay. how much oomph is left in your AHU. <laughs> Okay, uh, what is the difference between deviation and non-compliance? Deviation, so this is something that uh, I, I mentioned earlier, right? You have to define what a deviation. A deviation is from a procedure. O -O OS is a what a non-compliance with a test, right? So you have to define those and that, that is where most people make mistakes. They mix OOS with excursions. Oh, when do you have an OS? When there is a specification? Uh, when you when you have a, uh, are your environmental monitoring limits your specification? Absolutely not. Is your environment? Are you putting your environment in your in your product? No, you're making all. So sometimes people will call it by mistake OS, and then the OS list becomes so long, and FDA comes and say, Oh my God, you are out of control. You have so much OS, so many OS. This is this you have to define up front. What is a lab error? What is an event? What is an excursion? What is a deviation? What is an OS? Great. Uh, is there any standard rule to use 10% of fresh air or 20% of fresh air? Probably in the HU. No, I don't know. There is this is an engineering question. Uh, what is the difference between wraps? R A B Z. I'm not able to understand. Okay, let's see. What is the immediate alternate solution to replace conventional line meeting the current regulatory expectations, as the companies cannot afford to replace with isolators immediately? I have to tell you something. We've been doing retrofit, and I hate to say this. There are ways to do retrofit. It's all playing with the airflow, air velocity, uh, understanding how, where we can increase air, where we can decrease air to get the unidirectional airflows. You don't have to just go and change to wraps. And what if we make the mistake of getting off the shelf cookie cutter lab? You you know you're coming out from uh, you know fr frying pan to the fire or fryer to the frying pan, whatever. So it, 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 there are retrofits. You have to understand what kind of air, where you need, where you need unidirectional, where it is not. Can you play with with your uh, capacity to do that? And it is possible. We're doing this for a lot of companies. Okay, thanks. What is the difference between RABS and CRABS? Crabs. Okay, that is an open okay. RABS and, uh, and yes, it's not yes, CRABS, it's closed RABS. Uh, okay. Open open wraps is something that is taking the air from your room HEPA filter. It's just a box, uh, whereas closed wrap has its own air supply. How to respond the critical 483 on data integrity issue? I think this is a very <laughs> well. You have to identify the source of data integrity. Why are you finding data integrity? Is it always required to release any intermediate? using validated method? I don't understand this question. No, that is a very, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not very clear, yeah. yeah. In recent past, it is observed that big companies are getting 483s and small or new companies clear audit with zero 483s. Is there a difference <laughs> in FDA audit approach for companies? <laughs> I am not FDA, so I cannot answer that question. Okay, what should the approach to plug the gaps between FDA view of a company performance and company self-assessment? How do you get, yeah, stop. I say, how do we say, I come from Israel, so I'm going to say stop and smell the hummus. Um, 
stop. Oh, yes. <laughs> right, right. Stop and think. Why are we getting these issues? Why? Are we really addressing the root cause or are we doing a band-aid defect? You know, uh, I have seen companies uh, that had warning letter after warning letter in, in six months too, right? They took, they took the time to identify, uh, understand what the gaps were uh, and, and resolve the gaps. And, and then they had two clear for a year and a half, two FDA inspections, no 483s. It's also a commitment, right? It's a commitment. I told you knowledge base is very important. And take the time, take the time to understand, analyze the 483s, look at other people's 483s, see if we are having the same 483s. Great. So I think we'll take last two questions because there are still 30, 40 more questions. So let's take the last two ones. Uh, this is uh, when there is no production, when we have, do we have to stop HVAC? What, and when we stop HVAC, what parameter should be considered for requalification? <laughs> I love it. So you're not supposed to stop HVAC, but coming, um, the technology is coming out now. It's still in the works with the energy commission and our engineering head, um, where you can stop your HVAC and start with confidence. We are still not there. So they don't okay. like you stopping the, and let's say you said you, you have to stop sometimes for repairs, right? You should have start up and shut down and start up procedures. And those have to be very, very, very thorough. You cannot start a company uh, HVAC and start manufacturing at risk. I'm going to give you a case study here. And it's, 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 it's a horror study. It's not a case study. It, it just gives me, bumps when I talk about it. I walked into a company, I got called and you know, I'm in San Francisco, right? Um, got a company and they said, oh, we have a we have a problem. We have got this organism. What organism? I said, it's an act actinomycete. And I told you that there are as many actinomycetes uh, in the soil as there are bacteria and fungi. And I said, okay, and I, I, I drove there. It was in East Bay. And they had a negatively pressured virus manufacturing facility where they started making uh, um, some biologics, okay? That biologics needed positive air pressure, not negative air pressure. And, and for virology, virus vaccines, you need negative air pressure in the production room, right? In your fermenter room. Then I told them, guys, uh, this is very old facility. I literally saw, I could see and color and smell that actinomycin. And I've worked with many actinomycins in my career. And they said, oh, uh, we didn't tell you, but because we the facility was stopped for a long time and when we started, the HEPA filters were so full that one of the HEPA filters just dropped in the room and it spread contamination. So you have to maintain your HEPA filters and you should have start up and shut down procedures very thoroughly thought through, okay? Okay. And oh, this never is release on risk, never release the facility on risk. Uh, this is a, a question on COVID-19 currently what is going on. What specific additional precautions pharma companies need to take in view of current COVID-19 scenario? I doubt whether you can. <laughs> no, I will answer this. I will answer this. So yeah. beyond being a microbiologist and CEO of this company, I am also a Rotarian and I'm on the COVID task force, okay? One of the things is a lot of companies are going and selling all kinds of stuff. It, it is, it, it's very important to understand that uh, it doesn't need, um, bleach or this it can also uh, there's a, there's a small little article i have that uh, from our uh, disinfectant uh, consultant it's very easy to kill but the thing is finding it where it is and our static expert actually tomorrow on my linkedin there will be this uh, um, little article or uh, link to the article how static charge static charge is very prevalent in any clean room, as long as you have plastic or stainless steel or any surfaces. 
the uh, the speed at which this settles is ten thousand times or hundred thousand. I don't know how many times than than um, than bacteria. So really good cleaning with even seventy percent IPA is good. And and as far as precautions are concerned, as I told you, I'm a med school dropout. I'm a clinical scientist. In my good old days in seventies. I introduced HIV tests without gloves. Those days we didn't have gloves and we had mouth pipetting. Distancing, distancing, distancing is very important. Uh, wash your hands. The, it, it's, the fatty layer really dissipates. And that's all I can tell you. Great. Right. So I think, sorry. Uh, so I think there are another 20, 25 questions, but we will end the webinar here.